Thank you, Kristen, and thank you to Purple Beard for having me. Uh, first of all, if I would have known it was going out on a YouTube channel, I really would have made a much better <laughs> start and presentation slide. Um, there was a video that was meant to be rotating on it, but obviously, you know, technical issues uh, kick in. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. On, to, on top of all of the questions that you might want to throw in there, it'd be really nice to know, actually, while we're going along, I've got the chat on the, on the left thing here, is what you want to get out of this. That would be really helpful as well, because... One of the things we were talking about right at the start is that we don't want talks here that are boring, uninteractive and um, missing what you need. So please, anything, ask and throw it out there. More than happy to. So um, I am going to kick off the slides <clears throat> and this is going to be very open, candid and honest uh, as a whole. So like I say, and here we go, this is where all the tech falls through. So a very uh, quick introduction to myself and who I am. So I'm, I'm currently working for a company called Smart Tasking. They are a consultancy and I'm the principal technical delivery lead uh, there. And just a, a little bit in terms of my background, and actually I'll go over a little bit more in my background as well as we progress through the talk and actually closing out as part of the path of that journey. Um, I've had quite a few big brand names and one of the individuals that are on the call, I work with at um, one of these brands as well. And I've had a multitude of different roles in and around that, but a little bit more about myself and, and where I've ended up. Predominantly, my background has been within quality assurance. It's most definitely been my focus, um, but I have a passion for code. I kind of fell into it quite late and I've written various things, uh, good and bad, mostly bad, in Ruby, C Sharp, Java, Python, played around from everything across the entire delivery uh, life cycle uh, at this point. And the last point now, I've got education and I have a huge, huge passion and driver and this will kind of rattle through the talk as well um, in terms of education, both personally and continually upskilling, but out there in the world as a whole and how we view education and learning. So I'm very much focused on four key points here. Um, and again, I really, really care about what you want to get out of this. So um, please do keep posting questions in there as we go. We'll come back and address them all. But I want to be really open um, and, and, and transparent and actually look into what it is really to be a consultant. Actually, I find sometimes I, I asked a few colleagues recently and friends um, about what's the first thought when you hear the word consultant. More often than not, the first thought is often a problem. Uh, because you wouldn't normally bring a consultant in if everything was moving along swimmingly. That's not always the case, but um, it was just quite interesting to get that insight. What particular skills do you need to be successful and how do you start? Navigating the reality of what it is to be a consultant. Um, sometimes I think it gets a, a rather rose-tinted window. Um, it's not always all it's cracked up to be, as much as it can be particularly amazing as well. And how do you get to that point as well? Um, now, I care more about the key takeaways than the agenda and the, and the points. And I'm going to tell you the things that I would like you to walk away with from this. And I'm going to keep coming back to these points as we go through. So I, I do want you to get an awareness of what it truly means to be a consultant. Um, no one's the finished article. Um, it, it is really interesting when you hear the word consultant from a various aspects you kind of feel like there's a specialist in this arena it's absolutely not the case um they're all continually moving and learning as they progress as well and this is very much a personal one <laughs> and uh it may resonate with some and not with others but this is uh, a statement around be the jack of all trades or a specialist in some but you've got to pick a side and I'll, I'll dig a little bit more into that as we go through the talk. And there are good reasons uh, behind it in terms of where you might want to apply your skills and your passions and your interests. Just being transparent early on, resiliency and flexibility is mandatory. This is not a case where it's, it's, just, it's often a tough job. It, there's often a lot of demands and you're often out of your comfort zone. And the last key takeaway is deliver value and often. Um, and we'll go into that story as we progress. And also, if there's anything that you need to pick up question and answer, please do reach out uh, and drop a question in. So let's get straight to the point. What is a consultant? Um, now, it's, it's really interesting. And this links back to that key takeaway, making sure you've got this awareness. So let's just have a little bit of history on consultancies as a whole. 
So actually the first consultancy, after a little bit of historical digging, was Arthur D. Little, which is a firm that still exists today, um, founded back in 1886. That's one of the earliest um, you know, exposures in terms of the articulation of the word of consultant. So it was actually a chemical engineer, built a company in and around that specialism, and it started to grow from there. What we're used to seeing now in the modern day is pretty much companies such as uh, McKinsey and Company. And again, I should have quality assured this deck um, before that, that's actually 1926 under McKinsey there, and Booz Allen 1914. And they were the first major management consultancies. So very much dealing with how companies operate, do you have the right strategy to structure the approaches? McKinsey, obviously one of the largest um, global names, probably as a whole, and their longevity in the market, often referred to as the firm. Sounds very, sounds very gangsterish, doesn't it? Um, but what we do see a lot of now, and probably the areas in which we're, we're used to seeing is the, is the big four. So they were at Deloitte, PwC, KPMG, EY, and, and since the early 2000s, now we're very much at that case where consultancies like the big four there are, are continuously covering every facet of both management, technological, digital, anything you can name. They're trying to provide an avenue into it. Cybersecurity, take your pick. So there has been a huge transition over those um, historical times and moments. But I think one of the key things is that they're always just trying to capture the market. And there's a lot of things that are spoken about in and around consultancies and being a consultant. So just want to go back to that point that I mentioned at the start, is that when you hear the word consultant, what your expectation is of that, right? Because there is definitely an external view. So as we get into that, what are the definitions and the expectations? So this is going to be quite high level, but I'll dig into this a little bit further. So the expectations and some of the definitions in and around what it is to be a consultant is very much, and, and this is the, oh, let's just laser focus on the fact that I think this is a perception more than anything. And adaptability, fundamental. You don't know where you're going to be delivered to, deployed to, which company you're going to be assisting, or potentially what you're going to be working on, unless you've got a very definitive um, specialism, which bleeds into that SME space. You know, And I've put right in the middle there for a good reason, problem solving. I think that's the number one thing that 90% of the time when you hear the word consultant, they're there to solve a problem. Sometimes we don't know what that problem is. Sometimes it's giving in a statement of work. And sometimes it's so obtuse that we have to go dig in to actually find the problem. And I'll dig into that uh, a little bit more later. But it is a very much about that dynamicism of, of the skills that you need. And what, and what you're going to see here is that there's not that many hard skills. Yeah, I, I have principal technical delivery lead in my title. Truth be told, the amount of times if I had to broad brush stroke it as a percentage that I'm actually really bringing those hard skills, i.e. engineering, coding, cloud deployment, whatever it may be, is probably about anywhere between 5 to 10% of my time, full stop. The rest of it is very much around communication, collaboration, bringing teams together. But that doesn't mean that you do not need digital fluency. And I'm going to cover that a lot more when we get to the skills. So this is some of the definitions that when you roll out there as a consultant, and it feels ridiculously obtuse as well. It's kind of hard to gra grab a hold. What should I be doing then? And we will be covering that a little bit later. But what comes with that is, and it's, it's interesting, I want to keep going back to the word consultant. It's been, I personally feel slightly misused. The expectation of a, co a consultant is subject matter expertise, it's experience, but yeah, you get a lot of roles out there in terms of becoming a junior consultant when you're joining or trying to join the likes of a consultancy. So it's kind of a little bit of an oxymoron either side of it there. Now, just in terms of the expectations from clients, when you go to a consultancy that will provide you with consultants, they're expecting clear communication, number one. And we're going to go over some really key points of this a little bit later. Um, tailored solutions. Right. And just from experience, and I'm sure I'm not alone on the call, that actually a lot of times when you get involved with a client, they come to you with a particular problem that no one else can solve, or at least have not dug deep enough to really get to the root of the issue. So they're expecting this tailored experience each and every, every time. I've put in their timeliness and efficiency. What we really mean is we needed it yesterday. Can we have it today? So it's very much about that case of delivering value quickly. And I've just realized that I've got tailored solutions in there twice. So obviously there's a high demand on that space. And we've just raised the point around quality assurance of decks moving through as we progress this now. It's going to kind of look a bit damning on my historic career there. Now, 
the reason I put this one in there is very much about the fact that, and I'm going to keep elaborating this as we go through, there will always be problems, problems everywhere. That I think the main thing that I've experienced as a consultant going in is that you, you're very rarely lucky enough to be brought in and everything's going well. <laughs> you're, you're there to fix problems. So problem solving as a number one space really is it. And I'm going, to, I'm going to try and elevate that a little bit more as we go through. But if you took Woody there as the customer, you've got to be the buzz. Don't worry. It's going to be all right. <laughs> And we're going to step through it. And it, more often than not, consultants, seasoned consultants, so those individuals that have had experience in this space and are bringing the customer on that journey through it. Not always an easy task because the demands are high. So laser focusing a little bit further there, what skills do you need? So I really, really, really want to focus on the fact that um, no one is ever the finished article. OK, um, it's really interesting there and you can go out and gain a load of certifications yeah, and they're all valuable. Don't get me wrong, but every single day is a learning experience. It's about how you approach it. And I really I'm, I'm going to start picking out at this point what it is to be a, a jack of all trades and being maybe a king of some. But pick which side you're going to you're going to um, truly laser focus on. And I think it's, we'll get to that as a progression. Now, this is an interesting one because I, I, I spoke right at the start about my passion in and around education and technology as a whole. And this is a this is an image from a fantastic book called The Race Between Education and Technology. Um, forgive me, I can't off the top of my head remember the author um, and I'm not going to try and take a stab at it. But what's really, really interesting here is about understanding the approaches that we need to make towards education as a consultant moving forward. Now, the reason I say that is that I think there's a lot of pressure at the moment if you are aiming to get out there in the world of work and especially within consultancy that technology digital transformations is everything and that you need to know it all and yeah it, it is very very important to actually have a broad brush stroke but what we're saying here is that sometimes it takes a little while for education to catch up so as you can see at the bottom there blue being technology yellow being education we've had possibly one of the largest accelerations in te technological change and growth. And I'm not even going to mention the, the two letters that we have to hear every other day on every LinkedIn post under the sun. I'm, I'm actually just focusing on the fact that there is just so many technological advances outside of that. You know, cloud has been around for 20 years, but it's adopting faster. There are more tools. ML, it's why I'm moving away from the other two letters. I meant the one that starts with A, you know, there's machine learning, a lot more data work taking place. And the amount of change, the speed of change there is faster than ever. Now, what, what they're trying to say within the race between education and technology is that every time there's a leap, it takes time for education to catch up. So personally, I feel it's harder now as a consultant because things are moving so fast. And this will come back to the jack of all, king of some, is that you kind of have to pick your battles a little bit. Um, it is very, very hard to be all things to all people. But there are some things that will always maintain. And the transition of change is getting faster. That's what this entire paper is about. So normally when education catches, catches up, I don't think it's, it's going to catch up. I think we need to change the way that we work and the way that we, we learn and educate. So this is just more of a visual representation about the speed of which, and again, I'm just going to actually come back here, that you're never the finished article. This is day one of the rest of your life. Um, and I really, really want to uh, to, to nail that down so a little bit more context on that and, and the reason why I'm trying to avoid the two letters um, and some of the context of the changes in let's just just before COVID um, so there was a lot of work done and this is actually a McKinsey study going back to the firm and, and consultancies that are out there um, the biggest digital change that ever took place in history in my personal opinion just my personal opinion everyone will bring those two letters up and everything from open you know who they are um there was something that took place during covid that actually i personally i feel has gone under the radar a little bit here that was actually so dynamically changing of the global workforce and the pace of work that it's kind of been forgotten a little bit now during the pandemic um 80 of customer client interactions went digital in their nature something that a lot of technologists and a lot of companies have wanted to do for years, possibly even a decade before that. They really wanted to change that focus with the ways of work, customer engagement, customer experience. But we had no choice during the pandemic. There was this enforced acceleration that took place. Um, we all jumped on Zoom. Here we are. 
we were all using Teams because we had to. And what was really interesting here, and I'm, I'm not going to dig into each of these points, but the number one right at the top there it was really, really interesting and absolutely blew me away. So they went out to many, many of their large customers, large companies, and asked, what was the expected time it would be taken pre-pandemic for you to go from being an office-based workforce and the way that you deliver to becoming that online distributed, potentially global engaged workforce so as you can see the expected was nearly a year and a quarter year and a half exact was 10 and a half days now when you put that into perspective let's take a step back there in the reality so it's the perception against the reality so if you think about being a consultant and consultancies if a company ever chose to do that it would be really interesting pre-pandemic how much time they would have put on that when the reality sits there is 10 days so when we're talking about what skills do we need now? This is where it is very, very much about the fact that, look, we're, we're, we've digitally accelerated at least seven years. There are an in, I've got an entire separate talk I'll go through in terms of the digital acceleration of, of COVID and the expectation of future skills. So it's, honestly, it's a complete another talk. But from that talk, the World Economic Forum did a study, and they are obviously pushing this information out there globally. It's all perfectly available. So all you need to look for is the World Economic Forum's 2030 expected 21st century skills. Bit of a mouthful. <clears throat> but they've broken it down into, into three core competencies here. And I'm not going to step through all of them because I'm going to break it down a little bit on the next slide. But things are changing very, very rapidly and we're not changing ourselves fast enough. So when we talk about skills as a consultant, this is where I kind of want to lead on to the next bit here is that actually you have to look at take a look at those competencies and character qualities. It actually starts to become about who you are and who you want to be comparatively to the skills. So it kind of blends in between that hard and soft space. And what I mean by that is that you look at some of these here, curiosity by nature. These, these, these words I'm constantly using all the time within in the numerous amount of teams and people is that things are not just going to happen to you. You have to investigate, you have to get out, show your initiative. And that persistence and grit is something that's spoken about continuously. And going back to one of the key takeaways here is that resiliency and flexibility is key, but you have to keep driving. And leadership, social and cultural awareness, and I'm going to come onto a slide a little bit, how important now EQ skills are, and that's emotional, emotionally quotient skills, or just emotional um, skills and thoughts how important they are now in the workplace because it's not just us using tools um I'll, I'll go into that a little bit more but the competencies in around that is that and there is a little bit of a worry as well i think for the future is that things are becoming a little bit too easier too easy apologies for, with some of the tools that are coming in there coming out I'm really struggling with my english today um and that critical thinking and problems problem solving mindset is shifting away because we've got this um, digital colleague now that we can just throw stuff at. And um, I, I, I wrote an article about it recently about the, the potential of losing hard-earned knowledge. Um, I don't think we're necessarily going through the pain points as we used to. We did. It's too easy to find things out now. Google was the big transformer. The next one is the next adaptation. But we've got to make sure that we keep that critical focus, critical thinking, and creativity that's actually you know, actually coming up with those ideas to make a change. And hopefully you're seeing a lot, a bit of a theme here. You, you, a lot of people coming in expecting hard skills. Do I need to be a developer? Do I need to be this? No, you need to operate in teams. You need to get people working together. The solution's already out there as a group. The biggest problem that I find as a consultant out there is actually getting people together and work together. Um, it is incredibly hard. It's where 90% or 95% of my energy goes into. Um. And last but not least, those foundational literacies prop up these other two things. You may hear, especially within general consultancies, there, there is a historical, I personally use the terminology of historical, approach of people, processes, and tools. Something I find extremely frustrating when I hear it. And it's okay, it's just, it's, they're just words. But the attitude being is that if I hire people with skills and I have the processes that they can follow, and I give them the tools to do it, I should get X. I think it's actually, it's a very industrial, very potentially historic view. Whereas I prefer to adapt very much into this field here, which is very much about, well, actually, what's your culture like? Do people want to be there? Do people like being together? 
And then it's a case of actually looking at people's capability, which kind of bleeds into that foundational literacy piece that, you, that you're looking at at the moment. So when you've got the right culture, i.e. you're a company that supports growth, that you want people to bring their ideas forward, be naturally curious, show your initiative, be creative in your problem solving, we'll help you get the capability. Are you providing the right groundwork for people to get the right skills? And if they don't have them, what are you doing about it? Maintaining staff, actually dealing with your attrition rates. And then it's about looking at the technology to support everything else. Technology is nothing more. It props things up. There, every company is a technology company, but it props up all of the processes and things that humans do and absorb. So there's happy to be challenged on any. I'm expecting a load of questions that come in, and please do. But this is getting to the point there. ICT literacy, as it did, looks very, very different now. I mean, 20 years in this now, and I remember something getting something that was called my European computer driving license. Yes, that, that was it, the ECDL. I should check whether it double exists. If anyone's on there and wants a quick Google, please do. But basically, it was ticking the box to say that I could use Word and Excel and send an email. The world is very different now. The expectation is a lot higher. So where you see number four there in terms of that ICT literacy, it's a hugely different scope than it was then. Most of the consultancy work is in and around that kind of work, but it's also actually about structural and organizational change. So it's a real blend between the two worlds. Everything else is you know, relatively expected in terms of literacies. Now, getting to the point of depth and breadth of knowledge um, that you may have or may not have heard of the, the, the fallacy of um, the 10,000 10, hours towards mastery, i.e. if you spend 10,000 hours practicing at anything, um, you will master it. And that's all well and good to say. Yes, you can do that in piecemeal, but it, it, it was just a mistaken comment from someone who was doing a scientific study at the time. And it was a broad brushstroke, which everyone took as gospel. What really we need to talk about is depth and breadth of knowledge. And let me just go into those a little bit more now. So when you first start kicking out there in the world as a consultant and you're kickstarting your career, I think depth is ridiculously important. Okay, you, you have to start, and this is all based around that T-shaped skill basis. I always feel a bit funny when I talk about it. I'm not too keen on the terminology, but it's the, the best analogy for it as a whole, I think, for the time being. And I think depth is really valuable if you enjoy the doing part. This is, again, it's all very much, this is just experience and personal opinion, but if you enjoy development, you enjoy coding, data, whatever it may be, you'll make an exceptional career of being a king and building that depth of knowledge and being a specialist. And that's great. And you start there and you can still grow and that will be a very strong career and path. Absolutely. But there is another avenue. That other avenue is very much as you gain more experience. So you would you should most definitely start. Like I said, my background was QA. And whether I'd say I was a specialist at any point, there would be many that would call me out on that. But it was my start. That was my foundation. That was my center of the T. And that's where I built my skills over time. And now I'd say with that experience, I'm much more sitting across the broad spectrum where I have a multitude of jack of all trades skills that culminate together to give me a different viewpoint that someone with a specialism may not have. So I've been lucky enough to both have a passion in and around coding, education, technology, I just like learning. And I've learned everything from you know building Linux servers, at home, slowly, accidentally electrocuting myself and, you know, not treating um, soldering with the respect that it deserves all the way through to cloud deployments with containerized um, technologies. But I do that because it's an interest to me. It's just the benefit that that broad spectrum actually assists me in my consultancy career. The rest of it is just pure experience and a numerate amount of failure. <laughs> Stories to which I could go into forever, but it's really, really vital that you have a perspective of where you want to start and as you start to get that breadth is that don't think you're done even in the specialism you're not done you have to continually learn yeah we never really finish why well, i didn't put a finish finish stop on it it's just continual after that i'm sure it's, it's going to sound really annoying to some of you well i was full of learning and i'm nearly done i just get to work no 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 sorry it's a long old journey and it continues so I just wanted to really expand on the importance of social capital and EQ skills. And I, the social capital point, and I utilize that terminology for a good reason, 
And only recently is this a skill that I am trying to flex, a muscle I'm trying to grow, is that the importance of maintaining and building a social network through both your, personally, people will talk about it all the time, you will have your friends, you will have your family. Being someone who pulls the strands together to maintain a commercial or work-based network and it should be friendly. <laughs> That's the whole point of it. And having those emotional skills to be able to help bring people together in balance is absolutely almost fundamental at this point as a consultant. Um, and there was a study that took place. Um, I, I'm not just making any of this up. So hence why all the links are in the bottom left hand corner. I'm happy to share those afterwards. But there was a particular and, and the reason why I talk about this is that it's really important to understand how communication and operating in an environment with other people is fundamental because of the outcomes that come with it. So basically what happened was there were two studies. They grouped them 700 and, uh, 697 volunteers into teams and they just give them tasks to complete just to find out who would be better. Now, if I challenge you right now to ask, well, what type of people, what characteristics would you view would do well? And more often than not, and what they found of what type of teams were successful, so they balanced, did they have high, high IQ, were they super capable, were they just high performance internally? It was none of that, not even close. The characteristics that really stuck out and were completely apparent were those that had high social sensitivity, that gave each other time, that supported each other and gave each other space, listened and adapted there on the spot and just paid attention to what was happening in the group. They gave each other time, as I mentioned. Interestingly enough, and it's not me just saying it, it's most <laughs> you can click through the studies and find for yourself, there were more women in those groups. And I think that's a really important moment, just a flag and actually understand that there is a skill set that's sometimes missed in single gender groups sometimes. And not everyone has differing capabilities and skill sets. Um, but out of this study, it was just absolutely apparent that the communication skills that were brought by many women comparatively to men actually added an unbelievable amount of change to those teams. So you can understand out there in the market where there's a huge push, importantly and rightly so, um, and it's to help us all be better in short. Um, but this is why emotional skills are extremely valuable. That's why there are competencies. And you look at those 21st century skills, it's not all just banging the drum of go learn tech skills, get your cloud certificates. It's not. It is very much about how are you going to help other people be percentage based better. Yeah, if you walk in and you're ten percent better tomorrow, but you make ten other people five percent better, you do the math if the value is there. So that's what being a consultant when you're going there, you're often challenged with is that it's not necessarily you coming in to do the work. It's how do you work with a huge group of people to help them elevate what they're going to do. Um. Whew. A lot of talking not many questions so i'm hoping everyone's agreeing <laughs> if there's no disagreements as well which I'm, I'm chuffed to bits about um let's get to the navigating the reality of it there i think there's a, like i say i said at the start it's a bit of a, a rose tinted um view of it sometimes and as i say resiliency and flexibility is man that's the key takeaway let's get into that a little bit and if you're ever you everyone would have heard of the terminology of the good the bad and the ugly um but Let's just talk about what is good, what is bad, what is really ugly about consultancy. So this is just, again, personal experience, personal points. Not that this is anything to, you know, hang your hat on. But I, I find the challenge is great. It, you have no idea sometimes. And I I can't even actually pinpoint exactly where I sit as a consultant. As I say, I'm very technologically focused, but I've actually spent more time in educating and building and growing teams in, in the last five years so i it, it's great I, I love a new challenge each and every time um and it is extremely challenging without a doubt it's the dynamic environments i love being kept on my toes uh, i like the change yeah, yeah i think it kind of fits my mindset i'm quite if you can't tell by the way i talk sometimes and it's very um very energetic and i like to have new, new and interesting things sometimes if i get focused on one thing for too long i, I like anyone taper off on your concentration and kind of miss out so i like the dynamic challenges and me, i love meeting people it's great it's brilliant fun um I, whether i've met them before or not i have no interest it's great listening to people's stories and, and learning about them and it, it's it's one of the best parts for me without a doubt now some of the bad 
um, long hours, resiliency and flexibility. Um, I definitely think there's a, there's a huge investment. And I, I've been terrible at managing my time. If I talk about some of my failures, most definitely managing my time is hard. You'll see a lot of tips out there about you know planning in your time and focus time. That's a skill I'm only really starting to learn actually now. It's taken a long time and I'm getting better at it. But I, I have the flexibility. I'm kind of very lucky with Smart Titan, the company I'm working with now, um, who are just fantastic and learning a great deal from them. But at the same time, it's trust and the flexibility to deliver. And I will always deliver. And I think that's, a, again, a work ethic is really, really important. That flexibility and resiliency to keep driving through. Monotony. Now, as a consultant, you don't always get the choice on what work that you're going to work on. Okay, you, you may have that speciality skill set being the king of some or queen of some, I should add. Um, but sometimes there's just tasks where you're brought in and it, it's monotony. And I, I'll call this, get, it's an analogy I use rightly or wrongly, it's getting through your first day at the zoo. So I, I used to have this joke with people that I used to teach is that, well, what do you want to do when you first go to the zoo? And most people want to spend time with animals and feeding them and training and learning from them. So, but sometimes, you know, there's a bit of an ill animal where you've just got to go clean it out and you're going to be handed the shovel. And quite frankly, you start shoveling. <laughs> um, you've got to get through that first day because that's what you're going to be viewed on. And that's what you're going to be noted on. People need to see you getting in there. You're a consultant, deliver value, deliver off them. Uh, next point. Sorry, I'll keep, I don't know why I just keep losing. So the ugly one thing, yeah, it's uh, the burning building, uh, is, as I like to call it. As I mentioned right at the start of this, it's very rare unless you're working for a big four or a major consultancy that you are brought in at the start on what would be referred to as a greenfield site. And a greenfield site is that so you're starting with a blank canvas. More often than not, you're coming into what they call a brownfield site. We won't go into why it's called brownfield site. It's just a colour. But I like to call it the burning building as well. So sometimes you just you're running into emergencies, and that that can really be draining. It, it can be very very draining. It's not always easy, um, but it blends into that challenges piece. So although it can get ugly, it is uh, burnout is a thing. Hundred percent. Very rarely will you hear a consultant say no, no, no. It's a really easy job, <laughs> and I'm I don't feel pressured or stressed at all. It's it's perfectly natural. Again, you deliver often deliver fast have to be the end it comes with a pressure um but burnout is a thing you should respect it very much understand and keep a look at yourself that's the reality of it um hand on heart actually hit burnout myself didn't recognize what it was um so it was, it's a really bad not i'm not going to say it's a valuable experience to burn out don't do it please and but just recognize that the pressures of work talk to people be sure you've got that network supporting you and there is constant high expectations um that is a, you're being brought in for a very good reason uh, you know it's that term as an experienced consultant a consultant you're, you're here to solve the problem the expectations are high so you have to keep keep that in focus so deliver value and often now to the key points right let's get to some tips and being successful because i want to make sure we've got lots of time for questions near the end um have an opinion but deliver facts we all have opinions when you gather experience it's very natural to be led by your opinions and what you've read what you've seen out there in the market but be factually driven yeah if you're being given a problem space you should be diving in there to understand what's actually going on and actually as part of that don't get sucked into the problem that you've been given i think one of the things that consultancies and it's very easy as a consultant to get lost in is that you're given a problem statement and you get laser focused on the problem when a client gives a problem as a consultant, it's because they don't know really what they want as the outcome. And sometimes part of that problem solution is very much that you have to dig through and wade through all of those issues and actually get to the point of what do you really want to get out of this? What really is the outcome? And that's something, again, where I get a good reason why I joined where I am now is the fact that they're very outcome focused. Everyone has a problem. But what do you want to achieve? Where do you want to go? What does it look like in six, 12, 18 months? Uh, we understand it's a burning building, but that's we're going to deal with that that's okay we can fix it so don't get sucked into the problem make sure that you you're considering what the outcome is never more than three options preferably two and if you've got one then great and what i mean by that is that as you start to find the facts deliver the facts that you're looking into the problems and the outcomes don't deliver a 50 to 100 to 150 page document let's be blunt no one's ever going to read it um 
you would have done an incredible amount of work, I'm sure. But what a client needs is simplistic hyper focus on two things that are going to change the space, turn the dial and make it better for them. And that's your job as a consultant. You have to help distill that. It's very hard because you'll see the bigger picture and there will be all these moving things, but you, you may only be there to solve one thing. So make sure that you focus on that, get that right. Because that's what, if you're out there and if you're contracting or working through a consultancy, deliver what you're asked to deliver, get it done, laser focused, deliver regularly and often. The 80-20 principle, always, always keep that in mind when you're looking at those outcomes. Um, and you can look up this particular principle. It's relatively well known. Within sales, sometimes or investment banking, you'll find that 20% of the investment managers are making 80% of the profit. You'll find that 20% of the people are doing 80% of the work. And this is inherent. In, if you look for it, it's very weird how often it appears as a standard principle. Um, and it's a good way to help you laser focus in and around everything else. But with that 20%, that kind of bleeds into your free options, should bleed into the facts and absolutely focus on the outcomes. And last but not least, the hardest thing, full stop, to achieve as a consultant. And I'm going to rubber stamp this with my, my own personal brand. Um, this sentence was given to me about a decade ago now. Um, and it kind of changed the way I viewed everything. And it is to do with software design there. And I'm going to, it's the only thing I'm going to out and out read out because it is really, really important. So although it says software design, let's put that aside. But we're talking about, let's just say we're constructing something. One way is to make it so simple that there are obviously no deficiencies. And the other way is to make it so complicated that there are no obvious deficiencies. The first method is far more difficult. Simplicity and achieving simplicity is without a doubt one of the most challenging and difficult things you could ever do. Because number one, when it is that simple, people refuse to believe it. You have to hang on to that and, and, and make sure that you stay strong and, and be resilient. So if you don't keep it simple, it's very easy to fall into the category of complexity. And complexity is sometimes also as a consultant, it happens a lot out there. And there is a lot of disgruntlement across even the big four consultancies. So that you just come with this massive complex answer when really all someone wants is the next step, a simple next step. That goes back to that three points on making sure that you stay focused. So if you, you know, if you walk away with one thing from this talk, take that, put it on your wall, think about it every day. Are you making things too complicated, both for yourself, for your customer? What are you doing next? How do you get there? Um, there is no linear path, none, literally none. Um, this is, I, I, I thought about this quite heavily about what, what the path would be. And this is my career in logos from top left to bottom right and what I've gone through today. And it, if I was looking at it as an external person, there are some big brands on there, some big names. And people sometimes only see the brands. But let me let me just lay this out in terms of what the non-linear path looks like. At the CPS, I printed paper and uh, ran around collecting and collating sheets of paper for lawyers for two years. At Deco, I was a receptionist. And let me be clear, I was a terrible receptionist. Awful. Um, definitely not within my skill set. Um, Citibank, data entry, nothing more. Um, and in fact, at one point in Citibank, I actually worked in a bond, what was called a bond distribution area. So I shredded paper, cut, cut the bonds out. It was like a CDT workshop space where big band saws and um, various other things. And then uh, Bank of England, again, arguably to a degree, data entry and reconciliation. But that was where things changed and that I moved into test. That was when my QA policy assurance background started found an interest, moved to software integrators, became a senior test uh, lead there and become a manager there. Went to Bruin Dolphin, uh, again, started as a lead, moved into management with a hell of a lot of support from someone who's on the call today. <laughs> he knows who he is. Um, and then ICV was probably the big change for me. That's where I kind of went heavily technical, to, to be honest. And that was only because I was lucky enough to meet someone there that pretty much ripped the the rug from under my feet in terms of career um who absolutely called me out to say that if you don't do this you you you're kind of irrelevant he was he was great pretty mean <laughs> but he was pretty great in that i lost a night's sleep coming the next day i think he was expecting round two of the discussion slash argument and i just asked for help i, I genuinely didn't know what to do 
Um, and that's where my passion for learning more about technology and, and driving and building and on my skill set and realizing I have to grow a little bit more. I, I need to put the effort in myself. And that's where everything started to change. So from ITV, incredible time there, released some incredible applications and worked with some amazing people and learned an, a great deal. Went on to product ownership and a little bit of sales. In fact, at Infuse, um, head of digital studio at Suggestive, which was a bit sales, bit code, a uh, bit of education for people. And then uh, Sparta Global, which was um, an education company, very similar in some degrees to Purple Tasking, uh, and eventually led to Smart Tasking, which is now a pure consultancy. So there's no linear path to this. It's about you gaining your experience, learning as you go. Um, and I think experience is the key. Just keep learning, keep failing. Um, and I'll come on to the failing bit in a moment. Um, I'm going to leave it with things I wish I knew at the start. I think that's the useful stuff, really. Um, <laughs> the classic case and the benefit of hindsight, build your network. Um, I let that drop way too easily. You have, have to commit your time to engage and try and engage. And it's hard, life carries on and you still got your job to do, but build your network, go to events, meet people, talk to people, keep in touch. If you're more than welcome to connect to me today, keep in touch. Yeah, it's about the effort. It has to go both ways and you'll learn the people that will and the people that won't. Sometimes it would be months and that's okay. Sometimes it's years and that's okay too, but make the effort. It will change your career full stop. Number one, put that at the top of your list. If you can work with your passion, I lucky, I fell into mine. I, I kind of lucked out by having the carpet ripped from under my feet and someone telling me you better do X. And I, I fell in love with, software and hardware and engineering and coding it was great it was logical it, it fit my mindset and changed my structure in the way I worked as a whole but failure is your friend I had an incredible amount of failure it's only a failure if you don't if, if you don't learn from it and I learned from every single bit of it that's you ask any consultant out there none of it's been smooth sailing at all there has been nothing but bumps in the road but every single opportunity of failure is a growth potential you have to change your mindset towards it it's okay to fail hiding it's the worst thing you've got to come straight out with it face it full on this is an interesting one for some don't just chase the money um it's really easy to get caught up in the next job and the next job and the next job but actually going back to the burnout point they give a damn about your happiness and your growth as well there are other aspects yes you we need to live totally get that and there's great opportunity sometimes the grass isn't always greener Sometimes, actually, if you're working in an environment where you're learning every day, you've got an incredibly supportive group of people around you that you know you can learn from. That's bad. That's value you can't actually quantify. So sometimes take a step back. Sometimes actually have a think about the wider picture, which I've most definitely done. It deliver talks regularly. <laughs> a couple of us just did the did the thing again. There, that is going to be held against me for a long time. But get out there and practice link it to the failure point you know it, it, it's okay to make mistakes but get out there and, and start talking and have an opinion and have a belief and help people it's it's great and it builds your knowledge as soon as you start wanting to talk to others it gives you the confidence to to do that in many different environments um and it's really really important so it, it takes a it's a big jump when you deliver a talk for the first it's very nerve-wracking you will potentially sweat through several t-shirts but do it it will really really help you this is when I, I showed my wife this one, she says a bit of an issue. So having integrity, um, it's a ridiculously important facet of an individual. You you, especially as a consultant, you you're brought in under a layer of trust. You're gonna hear things from certain people that you probably shouldn't, and that shouldn't waver your view of them or the company. You are there to do a job. And when you, you hold your integrity, keep it true, keep it focused. And it blends into the next one, which is try to avoid politics as a consultant. Really, really important that you're there to do a job. You will take into account things that may be going on in the organization. But when you start engaging with building a network inside that company, people are going to give you candid opinions. And that's not something that necessarily should be shared. It's just going to help you build that picture. Um, and last but not least, help others. Like I said, 
instantaneously if you try to do things alone you go back to that failure point and keep looping around it for an extended period of time you will stress out it's, it's not fun try to show how important it is that you spending time with others and helping them get better or helping the team get better is actually an astronomical change in, in growth comparatively to you just coming in to deliver kind of fits a little bit more when you get to that breadth skill set and then the jack of many trades you, you kind of you're able to direct many more people because you have a bit of a wider experience but even in those specialisms you know identify people that you know might be missing a trick or just where you can come down and offer a helping hand and that is it